Hi everybody, my name is Scott Elliott. I'm the Executive Director of the Dr. Peter AIDS Foundation, also known as the Dr. Peter Center. And we are here on World AIDS today to do our first ever live virtual tour. So because of COVID, because of all the weirdness around, we're not able to take people through, you know, really. So we're doing this in this manner so you can get a sense of what is the Dr. Peter Center, what do we do, who do we serve, and how do we do it. I want to give a special shout out to one of our partners, Vive Healthcare, who's helped make this possible for today. So we're going to go inside, and just before we do that, I'm going to put on my mask, so follow me. Come on in. Hi. Good morning. How are you doing, Melissa? Oh, nice to see you. You too. So whenever we're now coming into the Dr. Peter Center, things have changed a little bit. You'll see people are masked up. You'll also notice that we have some sinks in here. So whenever a participant comes in, the first thing they have to do is come in, wash their hands, and they're greeted by one of our staff. So Melissa, can you just tell us what you would say to a participant? What do we do to make sure they're feeling okay? Well, I go wash my hands. Okay, good morning. What we oh. would do is ask the person if they are experiencing any typical symptoms of uh, C-19 or COVID. So we'd ask if they have fever, um, sweats, if they have fatigue, loss of appetite, and also if they have had a test, whether that test has been positive or negative, and if they've been in the hospital. At that point, we'd ask them to put on a brand new mask and definitely wash their hands. So follow me, I'm just gonna wash up, and I want you to meet Newton. Newton is uh, BC's oldest therapy dog, but he's not old, he's just mature. <laughs> and he's been working here, how many years? Uh, nine and a bit. So he's been working here over nine years now. Great, I am washed up and ready to go. Melissa, I know for World AIDS Day, you guys are doing something yeah. different and special. Can you show us what that is? Of course, come on in. Come on in. So for World AIDS Day, last year what we did is our art therapist created a tree, a tree of life, a very important symbol for us. And we had people put things on the tree that meant something to them for remembering someone in their life that has passed from AIDS and HIV. This year, behind Scott, what we have is another form of a tree of life. And what we're asking participants to do, and Scott, have, have you done it? Would you like to do it? I, I just did one, actually. Right. Thanks. So you take a leaf, and then you can put a person's name, you can put a symbol, um, something important to you in remembering a loved one. And that goes on our tree. We're going to have it here for a few days, and then we're going to have it as an art installation upstairs in the hall. Great. So the tree of life, ladies and gentlemen. And I put the name of a friend of mine from, oh, probably 25, maybe even 30 years ago now, who passed away from AIDS. So we're now inside the building. Uh, because the participants know we're here, they're actually, we're not going into the cafeteria area where a lot of people are having breakfast right now. We serve two meals a day, breakfast and lunch. And that's, um, that's one of the key reasons why people come. You know, we like to think it's because we're so fabulous, and we are. But it's really because the food is pretty amazing. And then they'll stay for their medical services and therapeutic services. Um, some of you may not know who Dr. Peter was. This is a portrait of Dr. Peter. His name was uh, Peter Jepson Young, and he was a physician and um, just over 30, actually pretty much exactly 30 years ago, he uh, started the Dr. Peter Diaries. And what they were, they were really uh, Canada's first reality TV show, and it was about the life of a guy living with AIDS. And in those days, when you come out with something like AIDS, it was also a coming out for being gay as well. So I think people were equally as shocked about his being gay as they were about him having HIV and AIDS. Uh, so Peter passed away uh, um, and from that created this concept of a legacy which is now the Dr. Peter Center. And so we exist to work with people who have HIV but also have complex medical um, conditions and could be uh, dealing with mental health, could be dealing with uh, substance use issues, and a whole host. And we treat things from a very holistic manner in what we call a stigma-free environment. So we go out of our way to, uh, to the best of our ability to make sure that people feel welcomed, nobody is judged, um, and we're just here to help and support people uh, through their journey. Some really fantastic things, you know, just thinking about since COVID started in March, um, we've been open every single day, we've never closed. We've modified our services a little bit, but actually the vibe of what we're doing right now feels very similar to what it would have felt like, you know, back in February, except we're all wearing masks and there's no hugs. 
we're kind of famous for our hugs here. And other than Newton, Newton gets hugs, but he's the only guy. And the other thing I'm just really happy to say too is that to date, we've had zero COVID cases amongst our participants, which is really fantastic. And that's in part because of um, really good uh, PPE measures that we've put into place from the beginning. And to be honest, our participants have done an absolutely phenomenal job of trying to take care of themselves to the best of their ability. And um, I'll tell you about the overdose epidemic in just one sec, but let's just walk down the hallway. There's some participants who want to come in and just watch out for Newton, the cameraman. We don't want to step on Newton because this is actually Newton. I, I tell people Newton is probably the most hazardous thing at the Dr. Peter Center. He's a trip hazard. Uh, follow me. Come on over. So we're going into the, there's two buildings. We're now going into the older part of the building, which we've got offices and office space and um, that type of stuff set up. And just before we go inside, um, what I wanted to just tell you about very briefly is, so I mentioned we do food. So if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's a triangle. We'll just get over to the side. Oh, he's making a tick over. Um, there's food insecurity, health and well-being, and self-actualization. Think about you know, a pyramid. So the bottom's bigger, right? So we have to make sure that people have food and that they have the nutritious meals and they have a safe place to go and to meet and to talk to people. And then the middle part is health services. So this is the clinical operations. We are a clinical organization, but we hide it all in social. We hide, we, Many people were traumatized by the healthcare system, so we do everything in our ability to make it comfortable and safe and for people to feel good about it, right? But we've got usually five nurses on at any given day where we do medication management, we do um, opioid replacement therapies like methadone or methadose you may have heard of. We also do injectable opioids, which is kind of a new service. Um, and one for people who need stronger doses. We also have North America's first supervised injection site. And that was something we didn't talk about for a long time. Uh, just because it's not open to the public, it wasn't exactly 100% legal for a long time. It is now. And, um, but now we actually work with organizations across the country and helping them to uh, look at and consider what harm reduction strategies they can put into place. And then the last thing at the top of the pyramid, hi, uh, last thing at the top of the pyramid would be our therapeutic services. So we do music therapy, uh, recreational therapy, and art therapy. Because if you think about an individual, we're working with the whole individual, right? So in order for us to, um, to work with people in a, a manner we call trauma-informed care, we want to work with the whole person. So I'm going to stop for one second. We're going to just um, walk inside my office and uh, start interviews with two very special participants. So. Uh, just hold on for one sec. While I'm setting up there, we're going to give you a two-minute it's a two-minute video of the rest of the center. So we've put together a video for you. So hold on, watch that. We'll see you in two minutes. All right, be back soon.
So hi everybody and uh, welcome back. Um, I hope you enjoyed our little video. We wanted to be able to show you the rest of the Dr. Peter Center without physically taking you there. A couple things just to add. When we think about the Dr. Peter Center, we were born out of a pandemic. AIDS is still a global pandemic and it's one that we forget about. And on World AIDS Day, it's something that we try to remember and we try to remind people that it really is out there. Um, we happen to have some of the best health care uh, for HIV anywhere in the world, right here in BC, or in Vancouver more specifically. Um, but AIDS is still a global pandemic and, and many people succumb to it every year. Right now, as you know, we're in this amazing space of, you know, there's the, our DNA is in a pandemic. There's the COVID pandemic, which we hear lots about on the news. And in Vancouver in particular as well, there's um, a lot of the news and there's a lot going on with the overdose epidemic. So we're dealing with this, you know, triad of things going on um, all the time. And, and that's really the space that the Dr. Peter Center works in. And uh, we try and keep people healthy all, all the way along. I forgot to mention two quick things. One is here at the facility, um, we showed you a tour. We did not show you what we call the residence. The residence is we have 24 units uh, for long and short-term care. They're, uh, they're residential units live in for people with complex medical conditions. And we didn't go in there for obvious reasons. It's not just because of COVID actually. It's, it's their homes, right? That's the way we view things. And we don't want to take someone um, to their home. Last week, uh, CBC did an amazing, uh, over a course of five days on CBC radio, and some stuff on the website. They did some interviews around the Dr. Peter Center. They interviewed some of the doctors that were working on the front line back then, some of the AIDS activists, artist Tico Kerr. Uh, Shirley Young, Dr. Peter's mom, was one of the interviewees. And all of these are posted on our website. So if you like, um, please go on the website and uh, check them out. Uh, they're really worthwhile. So now I want to introduce two of our amazing participants, Eduardo and Debbie who have joined us today to talk a little bit about their experience, um, why they're here and um, what it's like to be a participant here. And uh, so here we go. So what is Eduardo, so can you just tell us a bit about yourself and um, when did you find out you were HIV positive? Um, what, how did that affect your life? And we'll Yeah, definitely. Hi, I'm, uh, my name is Eduardo. Um, so 13 years ago, I found out that I was um, HIV positive. Um, uh, you know, when I got the news, it was a very, it was very devastating for me. Um, and then obviously, you know, I started doing regular um, blood works and so on, and I started taking um, the antiretrovirals. Um, and that's when I came to Canada. And um, you know what, uh, I personally didn't believe 100% um, that, you know, anything about HIV um, or the consequences of not taking care of the, um, the virus. Um, and then, you know, years went by and I, I got heavily into partying. Um, and, you know, when you're 20, um, or in your 20s, you feel, I felt I was invincible. And, um, and I actually thought that um, by taking the antiretrovirals, I was going to interfere with um, me getting high or getting drunk. Um, I was not honest with my doctors. Um, so my immune system got very, very um, compromised um, to the point where I develop a, um, rare um, skin cancer, a very aggressive skin cancer. Um, it's um, called Kaposi's sarcoma. Um, and, um, and, you know, 10 years after, I started to develop all these symptoms that I did not, I didn't know what it was. Um, I went to, once again, my doctors, and then, um, you know, after a few tests, they told me what it was. And, you know, after uh, this, serious diagnosis, um, I still, you know, didn't 100% take care of my health. So once again, I, you know, stopped taking my antiretrovirals and I stopped, um, you know, taking care of my health. 
and, uh, and once again, I was not 100% honest with my doctor. So I got really, really sick. Um, I ended up in the hospital, and, um, and, uh, and that's when I realized that I needed to take care of my health, otherwise I was going to die, literally, I'm going to die. And um, that's when um, I started coming to the Dr. Peter Center. Um, first, I did it just for the food, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and then, and then for the meds. And then, um, you know, it became a part of my daily routine. I also did it just to have an excuse to, um, you know, get out of my apartment some, on some days that I was not feeling 100% or, or just not in the mood to get out of bed. Um, and then things happened again and I got really sick and I actually lived here. I was in the residence upstairs for about six months. Um, and you know, very, very grateful with the staff and with, with the foundation because they took care of me. And, um, and then as I started to get, get healthier, I was able to transition out but still, um, you know, coming to Dr. Peter for um, just my meds and to see the nurses and, you know, see a smiley face um, here. Um, and, uh, and then obviously COVID happened. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was not coming every day, but I was still coming once a week. Um, and now um, things are a bit more back to my normal, which is coming every day for the meds and to see the nurses and, you know, touch base with the staff, the nurses. Um, and, um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Eduardo. One of the things that he mentioned, which um, Eduardo, I've talked about this a lot, and I think it's really important, is that we forget that we, we think AIDS is gone. You know, and um, technically, Eduardo has full-blown AIDS because of the skin cancer that he has, which is still not gone away. Um, he has full-blown AIDS, which means that uh, you know, it's very clear. If you don't take your medication, you, you can get sick and still die from, from this disease. It's just something we don't talk about, you know, mm -hmm. as much right now. And it's affected his health to the point even now, from what he's, you're going to physio two, three times a week. Yeah, two times In two. order to help his legs, we can relearn how to walk properly mm -hmm. because the disease has affected his body so much. And I'm just, I'm so grateful you're here and um, love seeing you. And uh, thank you. Yeah, just really glad you're here. Um, Debbie, can you tell us a bit about, um, we t I talked about the Dr. Peter Center being a stigma free environment, mm -hmm. right? And I know you've been coming for a while. What mm -hmm. is that? Is that first of all, is that true, <laughs> right? And second of all, what does it look like? And what are some of the things that I? Nobody, we're not perfect. Nobody is. What are some of the things we we try to do to make it feel good for you? Hi, I'm Debbie. Debbie Cardinal, welcome. Um, stigma free. I've been coming to Dr. Peters for the last ten years, and um, I know it's thirty years. So the last ten years. Um, in the beginning, um, I was afraid of men. Um, I, I didn't understand HIV and AIDS, and I, I was scared, you know, and there, there was stigma, I'll be honest, in the beginning, because I am indigenous. And, um, you know, I was looking for that, for that, that person that indigenous person here at Dr. Peters, and there was none. Um, but I had the nurses, and, and you know, I had Newton and, and Alejandro, um, and 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 talking to them um, made me realize, you know, uh, that they're going to the, sa the same thing as me. You know, um, they might feel stigmatized. I don't know. However, yeah, fast forward 10 years now, I'm so happy to say that, you know, Dr. Peters has introduced indigenous um, 
workshops. And I'm really happy about that. And it's come a long way. So there is a still a little bit of stigma. But, you know, that's everywhere. Right? And um, I know that Dr. Peters takes serious, they, they take it seriously if somebody's, you know, saying something about this person or saying something about that person. They do take it seriously and they do chit chat with that person. And years ago, I was that person getting talked to. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a diverse, it's a diverse center. And I'm really, I'm really happy to say that, you know, I'm part of it and have been part of it for the last 10 years. Um, yeah, thank you. Debbie, how has, has, over the past 10 years, I know I've heard you talk about your experience yeah. and yeah. Um, how has your, uh, how has the Dr. Peter Center or your, your, your time here affected your relationship with your outside friends, your outside family, like outside of the Dr. Peter Center? Has that, has it changed a lot? Oh, it's changed so much. Um, 10 years ago, I wasn't with my family. They didn't want nothing to do with me because I was in raging alcoholic and a drug addict and I wasn't taking my meds so of course they were scared and I had nothing to do with them even my children you know um, so I, I kept on doing drugs and drinking until um, my my therapist Alejandro took me to the hospital one day and he says, you gotta, you gotta stop it, Debbie, you, you know? And, um, and then I talked to a doctor and from there, you know, I realized that, you know, I need to, I needed to change. You know, I was 47 years old. I was living in ESH, which is another component of Dr. Peters. And, um, from there, because I had a stable home, and I was coming here, but I was still, still, still partying. However, my kids knew that I, I was stable. So I was getting phone calls from my, my children. And, and having that home, and having just to open the door and say, come on in, and they were just so happy, so that connection with them grew. And now, uh, you know, I'm six years sober. I have a job. I bought a car recently. Um, I live in Mohill and have been for the last seven years. I come here every day to talk to the nurses, to get my medication, to eat the delicious food, to love Newton, um, to see Eduardo. You know, um, I I'm sort of like the social butterfly around here. <laughs> And I, I don't mind that. Um, I truly believe that I do have a gift. And um, that's just, you know, being inside of here and learning that gift. And that's what people, you know, I have compassion now, which I didn't have. And um, watching people, watching the men, watching the women come through here, you know, I started you know, saying, yeah, you know, my passion grew and grew and grew. And I love each and every one of them here um, in a different way, of course. Um, they're very important to me, the members here and the staff. Um, it, it's come a long way from 10 years ago. And um, <clears throat> I... I'm so happy to be, for, I'm so proud to be part of Dr. Peters now, you know, to be sort of the ambassador, you know, like Eduardo and I. Um, you know, I'm undetectable. I, I cleared my hep C. And this is all because of coming here. And a lot of them don't want to take... You know, I always say, it's because of you guys that help me. And they say, no, 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 it's because of you. They have to understand that, you know, there's so much gratitude for them and so much appreciation for the staff. 
you know, and, and they have to know that, uh, how important they are in my life and have been for the last 10 years with my journey and them understanding my needs as an Indigenous woman as well. And they're very compassionate and understanding. And um, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Debbie. Um, you know, it, it's amazing when I hear you talk about the staff. We, we have an archetype that we think about our staff as quiet warriors. And what we mean by that is our staff are here to support and guide and help to um, uh, just show people, you know, and to be there and to walk with you. Uh, but we never, we try not to tell people what to do. Mm -hmm. We try to, that is your choice, you know, and, uh, but we'll be in your corner and we'll fight for well, you. Absolutely, yes. You know, yes. As, as much, as much as needed, we'll be there to fight for you, like the big mama bear, mm -hmm. you know, kind of roaring up. So we're just about to time. Um, any last thoughts or comments, Eduardo, before we wrap up? Um, no, just again, um, very grateful with the stuff. The, the Dr. Peterson Foundation exists um, mm -hmm. like us. Yeah, thanks. Anything else, Deb? Um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to the Dr. Peter staff and the foundation and for coming so far, so far. Now we have Indigenous programming in here, and I'm just so happy. Um, it took a while, but we did it. And, you know, Scott's a really open-minded guy, and he likes to drink fresca. So, <laughs> cool. There's a fresca shortage. And so on that note, with the fresca in the tins, there is a shortage. But I won't get into that uh, <laughs> by lobbying the, the, the pop companies to get that back out. So um, Deb and Eduardo, thank you so much. Thank I mean, you. This has been awesome. Um, I've, I'm chuffed. You know, it's gone great so far. We've got like one minute left to go. Uh, so why don't I, I'm not. Why don't I just say thank you to you folks and for everybody else who's on the tour, I'll just walk you outside and we'll do a final goodbye. So Bye. Um, thanks again and you guys can just follow me. We'll go See this you. way here. So thank you everyone. I'm so glad you were able to be with us. Um, we're just going to wrap up. And just before we do, there was a couple of uh, key things that I haven't mentioned yet. And, one, in British Columbia, across the, the Canada, but really in BC, we're in the worst overdose epidemic um, the province and the country has ever seen. Uh, just in the past um, eight months, or this year, I guess, 10 months now, we've had over 1,250 people die from drug overdose. And um, that's a sad and horrific statement. And I'm really, really grateful to be able to say that to the, to the best of my knowledge, we've only had one participant from the Dr. Peter Center who passed away from an overdose this year. So zero ca uh, COVID cases and one um, from an overdose. And while that's sad, it, we thought it could be a lot worse. So actually we're, we're feeling very um, grateful for that. So let me just take you outside and wrap out. Um, just going out a different door, I just got to turn off the alarm. Oh, already, it's already off. I don't have to do that. So follow me and we'll just wrap up. So as um, I'm finishing here, you can kind of see behind me maybe that we're in a very beautiful part of Vancouver's West End, which is one of the most densely populated areas of Canada, actually. And the reason I mention this is when we think about an organization that works with people who have AIDS, an organization that works with people who um, uh, struggle with addiction and, and mental health issues, and we're accepted in the community, we are a part of the community. And there's a real compassion that interplays you know, with that as well. So as you're leaving today, I'd like to ask you to think about you know, what can you do today that's compassionate? How can you be nice to someone? Uh, perhaps two random acts of kindness. Just go out. What are two things you can do for someone that they're not expecting that'll make them feel great and make you feel great? So that's it. Hope you enjoyed the tour. Hope you learned a little bit, little bit about the Dr. Peter Center. And um, just to finish, I want to once again thank Vive Healthcare, who made this opportunity uh, possible for us, and wish you all a very safe and happy day. Take care, everybody.